All right, so we're here today for uh, Global Knowledge's Type 1 versus Type 2 hypervisors, uh, sponsored by Tech Target. Okay. Um, what we're going to be talking about today, well, well let's, uh, first is who am I? That's a good place to start. All right. Oh, there. My name is Aaron Snell. All right, that's my picture there. I hope it doesn't break your computer. Um, I've been an instructor for over 17 years. I've worked for IBM, NCR, Microsoft. I've been uh, teaching at Global Knowledge for over six years now with no signs of stopping. And uh, I currently teach uh, IBM AIX and Power Servers, which is where my VM, uh, my virtual machine knowledge comes in into play. I also teach CompTIA certification courses and uh, TCP IP network fundamentals. Now, about the course, this is what we've got. We've got a hypervisor overview, just to give you an idea of what we're actually talking about. The hypervisor is sort of the core piece to doing virtual machines. Then we'll talk about part one, okay? Type, part, uh, type 1 hypervisors versus type 2 hypervisors. We'll compare both of them and we'll look at the cons of both of them. Part 2 of this unit of this presentation will be to download and install Oracle VirtualBox because it's free. All right, you can download this and work alongside this presentation if you like. Then you can create a VM instance, a, a container for the operating system. And then you can install Ubuntu, uh, which once again is open source and free to download. So everything we've got in part two is something you can follow along with. And by the end of this presentation, you can have a fully functional type two hypervisor up and running with Ubuntu Linux in it, assuming you're working from a Microsoft uh, laptop or desktop. Then we'll wrap it up with the summary, just to tell you what uh, all the pertinent bits over everything. And uh, then we have some closing statements from our sponsor. Hypervisors, part one. All right. Type one, we'll describe type one, describe the type one pros, describe type two and the type two pros, um, and then pros and cons. Now, type one versus type two hypervisors. First off, a hypervisor, what is it? A hypervisor is a piece of software that takes the hardware and virtualizes it. It allows it to be subdivided. Normally, when you have a piece of hardware, it can only run one thing at a time or one OS instance you're gonna load up Windows on it or Linux on it or uh, iOS X, sorry, not iOS X, OS X, yes, there we go. But with a hypervisor, you can actually have multiple operating systems running on one piece of host hardware at the same time. Now, they're all subdivisions of the hardware, so you do need to keep in mind that each OS instance is going to chew up a little bit of resources, okay, and you're going to need a pretty hefty machine to do this, but if you keep your um, expectations to a realistic level, this is something you can do even on your own personal system. Now, once we virtualize the equipment, we can create containers. They're called virtual machines also known as partitions. They, you then install an operating system on them, turn them on, run them, and it's just like it's another machine. In fact, it is, okay? Meaning you've got to do certain things to maintain that machine, and we'll, we'll get to that. But the end result is one host system with multiple operating systems running on it simultaneously and you can go back and forth between the windows. Essentially, you're running an operating system as if it were an application. And if it crashes for whatever reason, you close the application, 
but you don't have to reboot the main computer because the main computer didn't crash. What do we need to know? Well, first off, we need to have a host system, okay? Some type of physical hardware for this to run on. Then we need the virtual machine. The virtual machine is created by installing the hypervisor. That it creates a container that looks as if it's an actual machine to the OS that we install on it. So it looks like it's a full on legitimate machine unto itself. And you can have as many of these as you want, as long as you've got the, the CPU and memory to support them. Oh, oh, and hard drive space. The hypervisor is that virtualization software. There's many different types out there. Okay, many different manufacturers out there. Some are free, some are paid. All of them have benefits and downsides. Okay. Now, because of that, requirements <laughs> vary wildly. All right. Um, I lit up one just the other day and got it to run with just two. Uh, two gigs of RAM uh, on my laptop. And in fact, I don't even think I needed two gigs of, of memory to in order to run Ubuntu. Uh, what you would have to do is you would have to take a look at what the hypervisor needs to run. And then you're going to need to take a look at the OS that you're going to run in the VM instances. Do a little bit of math, add them all up together and see if you've got enough resources to run them all simultaneously. Any CPU can work. However, the more cores, the better. Each core is usually seen as a separate processor. Okay, and if you've got hyperthreading, those are also seen as separate processors. And the more processors you have, the faster it's gonna run. As far as RAM goes, you need enough RAM, enough memory to support all the VMs. And if you're running a type two, the host operating system as well. We'll get to that in just a second. The more channels of memory you have, the better. So for example, there's two channel memory, requires two DIMMs, okay? Three channel memory, three DIMMs. It's an extra wide path to the processor. Wider the path, the faster these VMs are going to be. On my laptop, they are incredibly slow because my laptop wasn't really intended to do virtualization. It was intended to play video games. Um, obviously, I repurposed it to do this work and play video games. Let's see. The other thing we need to do is we need some type of hard drive space. Now, hard drive space uh, can be done several different ways. What you can do, if you like, uh, we, we could take a, uh, the hard drive that's in your unit right now and then create files on the hard drive. Each file would be then seen by the VM instance as if it were a hard drive. So a file becomes a hard drive to the OS that you install in the VM. This is a great solution because if you ever need to move the VM from one system to another, you simply copy the image file and move it. And you've copied the entire hard drive. It also makes backing up your VMs a lot quicker, okay? Another thing that you can do is in most, with most hypervisors, you can actually assign each VM its own actual physical hard disk drive. The advantage there is it's not sharing with anybody and it's a lot quicker. It also makes it easy to move. You simply unbolt the hard drive from the one system and move it to the other system. Not as nice as copying a file, but still fairly straightforward. Another solution would be to assign it 
a LUN on a SAN. Assign it storage space on your SAN and have it use the network interface, which we're about to get to next, in order to access it, some type of fiber card, okay? Now, in order for the VM to access networks, routers, things of that nature outside the box, outside of your host, you're probably going to need to have your host system have a very, very nice network card, okay? Now, there is a virtual switch inside the hypervisor. It's in system memory. And it's just like a regular switch, but it's only the, the network is perceived to be inside the host box. So it will only allow VMs to talk to one another unless you bridge it over the host network adapter out to the real world. And I've got a slide on that to give you a visual on that. Now we come to one other problem, security. Virtualization can help security. There's no doubt about it, okay? Essentially, you can break down each, uh, instead of having one server be everything, you can have a VM be each individual component. So if that VM uh, goes down for whatever reason, whether it's being attacked by a network attack or a virus, it only takes down that one VM. However, each VM is perceived by the software running on it as if it's a full system, which means we need to update the host system. We need to update each and every VM anytime new patches come out and we need to put virus protection on each and every VM. Each and every VM is perceived to be its own box, okay? So we need to treat it security-wise exactly the same. There's two main types of hypervisors. These both work, they both work very well. Uh, the first one is a type one. It's called bare metal or native. Very uh, straightforward. You get the host system, you install the hypervisor software on it, and then you create VM instances on it. There is no underlying operating system. The, the base underlying operating system is the hypervisor software. Uh, Oracle VM Server, VMware ESXi are some examples of this. Now, in order for that to work, you might need a management unit, a management server to control the other servers that are running this, um, this hypervisor on it. But the advantage, really nice, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Hosted type two. You've got a system in front of you, more than likely, unless uh, you're reading through this through osmosis. Um, and let me know how you do that. I'd really like to know. Um, you've got some type of host operating system. It's probably Windows 10. Uh, might be uh, the OS X, or it might even be Linux, uh, some flavor of Linux we can install the hypervisor on top of that. Examples include VMware Workstation and Oracle VM VirtualBox, which is our example for today. We're gonna to be using Oracle VM VirtualBox. The idea here is these are really easy to set up because you've got your normal everyday desktop, you install the hypervisor software, create your VM instance, and then install an OS on it. And now you've got, in a window, you could have Linux while, you have, while you're running Windows 10 simultaneously. Makes it very nice to be able to do two things at once. A lot of Macintosh owners use a, a type of software called Parallels. Um, that allows them to run a VM instance 
of Windows on their Mac. And so they can have OS X as their base operating system and then go into Windows whenever they need to go into Windows. This is an example of the virtual network. Um, in the Oracle VM box, this is all done for us automatically. In the instance of the VM server and the VM manager from Oracle and for other type one hypervisors, you will have to set this up yourself manually. Uh, type one hypervisors are generally harder to set up, okay? They require a little bit more knowledge to set up, whereas the hosted ones, the type twos, tend to be a lot easier to set up. But it is an actual switch. It's just a switch that's in system memory, and it does chew up some system memory because, well, it needs to run somewhere. But it offers very quick communication between all your VMs on that one host. Now, if it needs to go to the outside, not a problem. There's a usually a single NIC or multiple NICs bound together in the actual server, not a virtual server, but the actual host hardware. That would then be used as a bridge to go to the physical switch outside. And there's many different ways you can set this up as well. For example, in this scenario, all your VMs are sharing your network bandwidth, all of them. You might have a VM that needs all the bandwidth. In most instances with most hypervisors, you can add in an actual physical card and give the VM instance ownership of that physical card. It would then own that card and then you've got full bandwidth and a way out to the physical switch. Like I've said, there's many, many different ways to do this. Um, I do suggest you look at the facts, the FAQs, if you, need to, if you need to look at a different network solution. They've got just about all of them covered. So type one hypervisor is more efficient. There's no underlying OS to chew up system resources. The only OS in there is the hypervisor itself, which means that all the rest of the resources can be used for VMs. So given a type one or a type two, you can usually run more VMs on a type one. Now, please do keep in mind, you're still going to need more than likely some type of management um, server, some type of management console. It usually doesn't take much horsepower. Usually a, a laptop will suffice to manage the servers that you set up as type one hosts. It is usually harder to set up because there are a lot more questions involved. You know, um, you're probably going to have to set up your own network switch inside system memory. You're going to wind up setting up VLANs. You're probably gonna set up trunks uh, these do tend to, the, they do tend to be more efficient as well as less prone to errors and problems because there's no underlying host OS for it to get tangled up and snarled up with. This is an example of a type one hypervisor. This is the, well, actually this is the VM manager for it. VM server uh, we've got, it looks like three VM servers here. My server, my server two, and my server three. These are three separate host boxes. And they're all being controlled by VM manager. So once you set up the VM server software on each of these servers, you use VM manager to configure those servers and configure the VMs on them. And as you can see right now, they're not getting very good utilization. They're only using a 3% utilization on this. Now, this course does not have enough time to actually go through setting up a type one hypervisor, but we will do a type two. 
So you can at least see that. But VM Manager is if you're if you decide to go that route, type one, this is what it would look like when you're controlling it. The type two, which is what our our presentation focuses on a little bit more here, generally considered easier to set up and deploy, less efficient than a type one, but it installs on top of the host OS. So it installs on top of OS X or Windows 10 or Windows 7 or Windows 8 and 8.1 or on Linux, okay? The host system can still be used as normal, although it's not suggested because if your main host crashes, all your VMs crash with it, okay? Also, the host OS utilizes valuable system resources. So all uh, comparing apples to apples, you're not going to get as many VM sessions on a type two hosted hypervisor. This is uh, the Oracle VM box manager. Uh, when you install the Oracle virtual box, VM virtual box, this is the screen you'll be met with. And from here you can add or remove, adjust preferences. Right now there's no VMs uh, listed in this particular slide, but we're about to change that here in just a bit. We're actually going to walk through and create a VM instance and then load up Ubuntu onto it. The hypervisor pros, hypervisors in general, VMs using different operating systems can share the same host without conflicts. You can run, uh, if you've got a Mac, you can run OS X as the host system, and then you can run Windows 10 in a VM and Linux in another VM, and they'll all play nicely on the same piece of hardware. Maintenance on one VM does not affect other VMs on the same host. The software for each VM instance thinks it's its own host system. They're not, it's all virtualized, but it thinks that. VMs are easier to back up, restore, and move than traditional OS installations. For example, let's say you're doing a migration, okay? You just bought new hardware. What you do for the new hardware is if it's a type one, you install the hypervisor for the new piece of hardware, and then you simply copy the the profile and the virtual disk image from the old unit to the new unit, and you're back up and running. What used to take a week of migration time can now be usually done in about four to five hours in most instances, okay? You can sometimes get it down to even quicker than that if you've prepared properly. Relatively easy to change or upgrade hardware on hosts without affecting the VMs, because the VMs still think they're on the same piece of hardware. They're just going faster now because, well, I am making a, uh, I have the expectation that you probably bought something newer and faster. Um, however, even if you did get something slower, it'll still work for the most part, okay? It, it would, the VMs would just not be as fast. More efficient energy and cooling utilization. That makes sense. Instead of having five boxes all generating heat and with the fans going, we've got one box generating heat and chewing up electricity and the fans going. So not only is it more efficient on energy and cooling, but it's quieter. Don't know how many of you guys have walked into a server room, but uh, it can get really noisy sometimes. More efficient rack space utilization. What at one point in time took up maybe 15 slots, takes up three on a rack. And it's overall cheaper to implement because once again, we don't have to buy as much hardware. It's not perfect, okay? If one host system fails, all the VMs on it are affected. So we need to make sure that when we purchase our host system, 
that it has a lot of redundancy built into it, dual power supplies, um, dual channels, quad channel possibly, uh, for memory, whatever we can get in there, multiple hard drives, anything we can do to make it more redundant. So if one piece fails, another piece takes over for it. Remember that security needs to be done at the host level and on all the VMs. And security. Anybody that gets access to this thing has access to all the VMs on it. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. It's not a perfect solution. Okay. I hear a lot of people saying, oh, we need to, we need to go and uh, virtualize all our equipment. Well, if it fits your needs, yes, go ahead. But there's going to be times when it doesn't fit your needs. And you shouldn't virtualize it just because it's the latest catch-all term or buzzword. Just keeping that in mind as well. Part two. Here we're going to download and install Oracle VMBox and install Linux Ubuntu into a VM instance after we've created it. Once again, you can follow along if you like on your own system. Here is the website that you would go to to get VirtualBox. It is free. And it, it, uh, they've got a wide selection of choices, so you can pretty much download Oracle VMBox for just about any computer out there that you would normally run virtual instances on. You can even get some of the data sheets for this if you want to look at something hard <laughs> before you commit. Um, there is a way, it's not suggested, but there is a way you can actually run it as a live load, I've been told. I have not tried that, mainly because I don't see the usefulness of that. Oracle VM VirtualBox. Okay, so we've downloaded it. Note we're about to download it. Okay, and it's got uh, Windows, Mac OS X, Solaris 10 and 11, and then if we had the ability to scroll on down, we'd see all the Linux platforms. Uh, it fits a wide variety of uh, hosted OS uh, support solutions, okay? Um, I downloaded the Windows one because I'm running Windows 10. And then when I set it up, I'm greeted with this screen. Welcome to the Oracle VM VirtualBox 6112 Setup Wizard. All right, we're going to go ahead and click Next because there's no questions it's asking me on this screen. Here's some options. Well, what it's showing us right at the very top of that option tree is the VirtualBox application. That you have to have if you're going to install the hypervisor. That's the hypervisor right there. Next would be the VirtualBox USB support. If you don't load that up, USB will not be virtualized. That's okay. Maybe you don't want USB virtualized. There's a lot of security instances where uh, we would normally go out and turn off the USB interfaces uh, for security purposes, mainly so that people don't, you know, put a, a, a USB key that they found out in the out in the parking lot into the system and infect it. You can also, if you decide, to load up VirtualBox without any networking. If you are in a sandbox mode or a black hole site, essentially a site that has no connection to the internet and never intends on having a connection to the internet, and they're all standalone instances, why bother loading it up if you're not going to use it? In most instances, though, you're going to be using it. So the networking is there. Now, if you need to get to the outside world, to that external switch, and possibly to a router at, after that, 
you're going to want to turn on the virtual box bridge. Okay, that allows you to use the host's network card to get out to the real world. The other one is also a networking feature. The last feature we've got here is VirtualBox Python. I'm not a programmer. I don't pretend to be. I don't even play one on TV. But I know a lot of people that swear by Python. Some people swear at it as well. Your call, however you want to do it. But if you want Python to be able to be utilized, you can turn that on, that option. And if you don't want it, don't need it, you can deselect it. Okay. Now I left all of these on because I wanted to see what the system could do. So I'm going to go ahead and click next. And we get the normal custom setup features, you know, create start menu entries, shortcut on the desktop, shortcut in the quick launch bar, uh, register file associations. What file associations? Well, the profile for the VM and the file that the VM's going to be using as its hard drive. Remember that? Yeah, well, we'll get to it again. I left all of these checked and clicked next. So far, I haven't really had to do anything other than hit enter a lot. All right. Warning, network interfaces. Remember, I chose or left open the ability to have the bridge. Okay. Because I wanted to be able for uh, my VMs to talk to the outside world. So, what it's doing right now is it's binding. It's turning everything off real quick. And it is very, very quick. Turning it all off, attaching an alias to my NIC, setting up a NAT server um, on, the, on that NIC so that it can then act as sort of a mini router to get to the outside world. Okay, so there'll be the network inside my box and then the switch outside the box would be the other side of things, but it does it using a NAT server. Proceed with installation now. Yes. Click install, click, click install to begin the installation. If you want to review or change any of your installation settings, click back and then click cancel to exit the wizard. So we're going to go ahead. We know we chose everything correctly, mainly because I uh, snapshotted it and put it in this presentation, huh? There we go. Click install. And this took, they say several minutes. It, it took a bit, but remember, I'm running it on a, a laptop, okay? It's... Uh, Generally, if you're going to be doing virtualization, you want to have a little bit more horsepower than my laptop would have. Now, my laptop is a gaming laptop, so it's still a lot faster than somebody else's non-gaming system. But this isn't a system that I would run VMs on and put them into production. It's just not, not the right piece of hardware for that solution. Eventually, It'll uh, light up the next button, and then you'll come to this one. It's complete. Remember, I didn't really have to do anything other than hit enter, and I've now installed a hypervisor on top of Windows 10. I'll leave the Start Oracle VM Virtual Box after installation, and I'm going to click Finish. After I click Finish, I come back to the Oracle VM Virtual Box Manager. At this point in time, if I've got VM, uh, VMs from another system, I can add them to my Virtual Box Manager simply by copying the files over and clicking Add, and then telling them where those files are at. Or I can click New, or I can import and export the files and I can adjust preferences. And keep in mind, I can press the F1 key at any time to get instant help, or I can go to the form, which we'll discuss a little bit later. 
I'm going to go ahead and click new. And now it's asking me, okay, you want a new vir virtual machine? What would you like to name it? Now, right now the name's blank. I named mine test one. And then the machine folder, I left the same, but you can put it anywhere you like. That you might want to put it in a, in a separate directory or maybe even on a separate drive. Then the type, it says Microsoft Windows. Okay, if you were doing a Linux virtual machine, you'd click the little drop down icon, a little twisty there, get the drop down menu and choose Linux. If you were doing Mac, um, you could choose Mac. Now, there are some caveats if you're choosing OS X. We'll get to that. Okay, there are some uh, issues with OS X. And then you get to choose the version. For example, on the Windows, when I go down to version, it gives me Windows 7, 32-bit and 64-bit, Windows 8, 8.1, 32-bit and 64-bit, and Windows 10, 32-bit and 64-bit. And it goes backwards as well. I don't want to remember Vista, but it's there. Even Windows 98, okay? And depending on which hypervisor you use, you might be able to go back to Windows 95 or maybe even Windows 311. I can't be certain why you'd want to do that, but I'm sure you've got a good reason. <laughs> I just left it Windows. My next test I did was Linux. Okay. So for this one, it, it, uh, for the slides I've got in this situation, I would have picked Linux and I chose a, a Debian, uh, sorry, Ubuntu Linux 64 bit. This next option is asking me how much memory I want. Out of the 16 gigs I've got, I gave it two gigs, 2048 megabytes. And there's a little slider. You can move the slider or you can type in a number or use the up and down arrows to adjust the amount of memory that's given to the VM. Now, something I didn't see is how many processors. Oracle VM Box can do processors as well, but it's a piece of add-on software that we have to download separately. It's still free, but we have to download it after the fact and install it. But once installed, we then have options. Without doing that, the option is one core or one processor, okay? I left it at two gigs and chose next. Now it's asking me about the hard drive. We've got the option to add a, do not add a virtual hard disk at all. That's going to make it hard to run, you know, if it has no hard drive, but if you're doing a virtual fiber card and you've got a LUN already assigned to that fiber card, that might be why you would want to not add a virtual hard disk. You've got storage on a SAN. You can create a virtual hard disk right now, or if you're cloning your VMs, you can copy a file, copy a virtual disk image, and then say use an existing virtual hard disk file and then tell it where it's at. I left it as create a virtual hard disk now and clicked create. It gave me three options. The virtual box disk image, which is the default image for Oracle's VM virtual box. VHD, all right, VHD is the default for Microsoft's virtualization solution, Hyper-V. I've also heard it pronounced Hyper-5. Um, it depends on who you talk to. And then VMDK, Virtual Machine Disk, which is the native format for VMware and VMware ESXi. 
really what it's asking you is how compatible do you want it to be with other hypervisors you might be running in your environment. If all you're running is Oracle, leave it VDI. If you're trying to get it to play nicely with Microsoft, Hyper-V, you're going to choose VHD. And if you're trying to get it to play nicely with VMware, you're going to choose VMDK. I left it as VDI, mainly because my poor little laptop can't really do more than one of those things at a time anyway. Now storage on the physical disk. What it's asking here right now is do I want a fixed size of hard drive file? Or do I want it to be dynamic? So if I need more space, it'll chew up more space. I left it as dynamic. That's what it defaulted to. And if it needs to, it will go out, see if more space is available and increase the hard drive size, technically increase the file size because it is a virtual file. Now it's ready to create and it's asking me the size of that virtual hard disk. It defaulted to 50 gigs. I left it at that. Now I did notice that when I chose Microsoft, it only gave it 20 gigs. I always thought it would be the other way around, but that's what they said. That's what they suggested. So I left it as is and clicked create. Now I have my container. I can now see it, test one, and it says powered off. Here we can see what it's got in it, general, system, display, storage, audio, network. If you do have a really nice video card, there is an add-on that you can install and it will use the video card's extra capabilities. If not, it, it's, going, if not it's going to be capped off at 800 by 600. Usually we do these for work, and usually that's large enough, but it's up to you. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go out and get Ubuntu. So we went to the Ubuntu site, and I downloaded the Ubuntu desktop. Here we go. I then powered on test one. The, uh, the Ubuntu that I got came in an ISO file. So I powered on the VM box and pointed it at the Ubuntu ISO image. And now it's booting from that ISO image. Very, very nice. Worked flawlessly. I then finally got to the install screen and it's just like installing Ubuntu on any anything else or installing any OS for that matter. I choose English. I actually went with the install Ubuntu instead of try. Try Ubuntu is usually used for a live load on a USB stick. That way it runs entirely off the USB stick and doesn't touch your hard drive. But I've already set up a file, a 50 gig file I figured, why not? Let's just go ahead and install it on that 50 gig file. So I chose install Ubuntu, chose English keyboard layout, and then it asked me, do you want to install anything else? Do you want a minimal installation or a normal installation? And any other options? I chose download updates while installing Ubuntu saves time after the install. And you could also do third-party software for graphics and Wi-Fi hardware. I clicked continue and it asked me what the installation type was. Now at this screen, I got a little worried. I always get worried at this screen because when it says erase everything, I wanna double check. But notice, it says this computer currently has no detected operating system. Well, obviously it's not seeing my full drive. It must be seeing the file. So I chose erase disk and install Ubuntu. 
It'll delete all your programs, documents, photos, music, and other files in all operating systems on that file that it thinks is a hard drive. Or you can choose something else. You can create whatever you like, if you're familiar with partitioning up a hard drive. I chose install now. And it gives you one more chance to make sure you're doing the right thing. I double checked it, looked good, and I clicked continue. Then it asked me for time zone. I'm on the East Coast, so I chose New York. And then it asked me, who are you? I chose login automatically. All right, I didn't want to spend time adding in my name, my computer's name, password, all of that, mainly because this was simply a test. If you were putting it into actual production, obviously you would use um, all the pertinent information and definitely password protected. I chose login automatically and then chose continue. Okay. And uh, I was not able to, um, to leave everything blank. I just put my name as test, and then it filled in everything else except for the password. And notice it says weak password. Well, the password I chose was password with a zero. So, but it's easy to remember. Once again, it's a test unit. I clicked continue. And now it's installing Ubuntu. Finally, we got to the insta installation is complete. You need to restart the computer in order to use the new installation. I got worried at this screen too, because anytime it says reboot, I want to make sure it's rebooting the right thing. But it was in the Oracle VM virtual box, so we should be safe. I clicked restart now, and sure enough, it rebooted the Oracle VM box, not my main system. It says, please remove the installation medium and then press enter. I went up to the devices and you can't see it. Um, I tried to capture it, but if you go up to devices, you can actually see if the medium is installed in the virtual optical drive or not. By default, it isn't at this point, okay? but I'd like to double check. So I did, I pressed enter, I got that screen, and then eventually it came back up to this and it said, connect to your online accounts. I skipped. Live patch, set up live patch, yes or no, next, okay. Live patch just keeps your computer secure and up-to-date by applying some updates that would normally require restarting. And then help improve Ubuntu. All right, I said, no, don't send system info because mine's not in production. So I clicked next again. Privacy, I kept location services off. And now we're ready to go. We can use software to install apps but we're running Ubuntu, we're, we're in. It's running in a virtual machine. There was an update. You're gonna have to do all your updates just like a normal system would. And then here we go. Isn't that pretty? We now have a machine running in an app on the machine. So I'm running Windows 10 concurrently with, or with uh, Ubuntu on the same screen. So what did we do? Well, we compared and contrasted hypervisor types and features. We discussed the benefits and downsides and requirements for client virtualization. And then we downloaded a type two hypervisor, Oracle VM box, installed it, created a VM OS instance, right? 
In this case, the OS was Ubuntu. We created the VM first and then installed the OS on it. Now, troubleshooting. Hmm. Well, the best way to do troubleshooting for this is it's got a wonderful form. This is the form for VirtualBox. It's supported by Oracle. Anything you might want to know about any of these, they're all right there. General information, installation, if you're having uh, trouble installing a specific piece of hardware, maybe a network interface card that needs a specific driver. There's network related and USB issues. If you needed to do something different with storage, there's the storage option. Okay, and then there's advanced platform related questions. So if you've got a deep question, they can answer it as well. Now, at the time I hit this site, I was the only person logged in at the time, but it was also three in the morning, so I don't blame them. <laughs> Other things, I wanted to call out um, Mac OS X. Uh, one of the questions I get quite often can I run an OS X instance on VirtualBox? The answer is yes, but, okay. First off, you cannot do it on anything other than a, uh, a Mac. You can run VirtualBox on a Mac and then run OS X in VirtualBox. It's the only way it's supported. You're gonna have to get another license you're gonna need another OSX license. The OSX license, the way it's written, is one instance per license. So you can't just crank out 15 of them and only pay for one license. You cannot run it on a Windows system. You cannot run it on a Linux system. It has to be on a Mac, okay? But it can be done. Other courses would include data center and cloud management, data center virtualization and cloud infrastructure, uh, desktop virtualization and enterprise mobility management. Probably one of the first ones you're going to want to look at is maybe the VMware vSphere install, configure and manage for version seven. And then if you need more than just a, a few boxes, a few virtual boxes, virtual servers, you might take a look at the uh, VMware Horizon 7, install, configure, and manage. Remember that you can save money on your next course simply by using these promo codes. For the US, it's Webinar 25, and for Canada, it's CA Webinar 25 for 25% off your next course. For additional on-demand and live webinars, white papers, courses, special offers, and more, please visit us at Global Knowledge. And I've been your host, Aaron Snell. Thank you for joining me for this. Have a great day. Thank you.